the Windows CDP to me. So let me share that one here. So, okay, guys, uh, are you seeing here my HackMD? Yep. Okay. So, uh, I'll post the, the link of that on the, on the, the, the Bitcoin channel so that uh, you all, everybody has access to it. And I mean, uh, the everything is open. And I mean, if you guys want to put something on that HackMD, put any reference or, I mean, any think that uh, you think that it should be there, uh, feel free to add. So some of the things that I was thinking for today is that, let's say, uh, I did some backlogging uh, since the last week. So now we have the only gap population working. I did some fixes on the optimizer and so on, did some changes on the Bitcoin repo. And now we can't, we can't get on the values of the only gap. And I'm going to spend some time, uh, let's say, Give a brief, uh, debrief about that, and also some about some of the results. Uh, I think that Octopus would like about that because let's say one issue that we run into is that the quadratic funding algorithms is somewhat slow in the sense that, I mean, the quadratic funding algorithm has quadratic complexity. So what it means is that it's very hard to you to do a exhaust, uh, let's say, a comprehensive search for the optimal solutions. But I'll talk about that shortly. But anyway, uh, one thing that I put uh, that I would like to work to, for today is to see how, what is the impact of when we put attack vectors inside the Gitcoin grades data set. So the idea is that uh, one of uh, my colleagues at Block Science, uh, Jaja, uh, she she has been studying quadratic fund for a while, and she does and she has mapped uh, some uh, some possible attack vectors. And the idea is that, let's say, she created a notebook here that, that uh, encapsulates how to create those attack vectors. And the idea would be to, uh, to let's say, to get a subset of the real data and to inject uh, those attack vectors and see how is the optimality gap distribution on them when compared to the graph when you don't have them. So we are going to do, essentially, uh, A-B testing. We want to see how... Uh, we want to see how things go when you don't have those attack vectors, what are the optimal gap without them, and how is the and how is the optimal gap distribution when you have those attack vectors? And I mean, my hypothesis is that it's going to be different, but uh, we need to we need to work on that to to start to see it. So I'm going to give that update. Then we are going to. Uh, dive a bit of how we could inject arbitrary subgraph inside the contributions graph of Bitcoin. We would sp spend some time investigating uh, how to inject the first vector and also calculate the gap when you have that first the attack vector. And the same thing for when we inject a second version of the attack vector because there are two attack vectors. Uh, is everything fine so far? Uh, any quick questions about uh, the overview? the agenda. Okay. So uh, I'll give a brief update, uh, update then about uh, what has happened since the last week. So uh, let me change here the, the screen. So I'm going to my best code now. Okay, so first I, I'll show the notebook for optimality gap. That was the notebook that we've been working on the past sessions. And now that we have, we can calculate the gap, I can show some results. So uh, let me open that. It takes a while when you try to open the first time. It's connecting here. It's creating a Jupyter instance. OK. So this is the, the notebook. Yeah, I've been putting some work on that in the sense that, let's say, for example, one thing that I put here at the introduction is what it means for the gap in terms of additional match. 
É... So, what it means is the following. Uh, suppose that you have a grant that has an outlet gap, for example, of 0 0.5. Uh, one way of, of interpreting the outlet gap is by the following. If the grant, grant rearranges its contribution, let's say if the community around that grant rearranges its, its connections in the optimal way, uh, it's going to have an additional match. So I, I have put here some rules of thumb of how much additional match the grant is going to have for, for a given the gap. So for example, for a grant with 0 0.5 of a opnality um, um, gap, it means that if that grant rearranges all its connections so it, that is op, is, it is now optimal, that, that com community around that grant is going to receive uh, two times more additional match. So, in a certain sense, the opportunity cost of uh, not being optimal is being two times. Hey, Danilo, are you able to increase the font? The font size? Ah, yeah. Is it better now? A little bit better. The screen is coming through a little bit blurry for me. It might be the... Uh, see that? Yeah, this I can read. Uh, hopefully, the screen resolution will... Clarify. I don't know if it's just for me or for everyone, but no, it's actually same here. I was trying to manipulate the settings of the board. Hmm. Uh, let me test something here. Perhaps it's the cows. Maybe if, if I share the screen here, let me see. If... Or maybe I mean, a, it might be a bandwidth issue, so I don't know. Can you try like turn off your video camera and see if that helps with the yeah. resolution? Yeah, I think I I also disconnect my my second screen here so that I can share my screen because I think it's a bit better. So let me work through that. So, okay, I think that you are seeing my screen. Uh, it's, is, it, is the resolution a bit better? Mm, it's the same. Mm. So let me see here what we can do. I think, I think if, he, if he is subscribed to Discord Neutral, they will give him higher resolution, and that will help him out. I think it's only cost three dollars for the whole month. Maybe we can boost the server too. Uh, and now. Yeah, much better That's, now. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely cool. much better. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a setting on when you shared the screen. Now, for some reason, my VS Code entered on the night mode. Uh, I don't know why, but I think that uh, we're going to. Oops. Mm. What's the command? I... Whoa, I lost my... Okay, I, lo I lost my... I lost that, that markdown that contained the, uh, the information. But anyway, I'll open here to get it quickly so that we can go through it. So I, I was, as I was saying, the, for each optionality gap value that we could have, uh, we can also we can interpret that as let's say as giving an information of how much additional match you could have. So a grant with open gap of 0 0.5 means that it could have two times as more uh, match if they adopt a, a, a more arrangement. And let me see if I can. There is a trick here. I'll close that and open again. So uh, that idea of that, uh, 
each value of optionality gap can give you a different uh, additional match is a useful term, uh, rule of thumb to, to interpret uh, what it means in concretely. So for example, if you have an optionality gap of 0 0.9, that we, you are going to have 10 times additional match if you adopt an optimal arrangement. And if you have an optionality gap of 0 0.1, you are going to have only 11% additional match. Uh, is it clear that? Uh, yeah, cool. OK. So anyway, uh, to go through uh, some of the results that I had uh, on, on the backlog on this week, I did, uh, did some fixes here. So now we can actually get the opportunity gap. Um, this is our first histogram. And this histogram relates to the, to the data of Gitcoin grants after, let's say, the, uh, after it had uh, 200 contributions. Uh, I will not calculate the optimality gap for the entire data because as we, we are going to see, we have some serious performance issues. But anyway, let's say as a proof of concept, this is proof that let's say we can actually get at, at, uh, at, at the optimality gap. Uh, but there is only a disclaimer that right now the optimality gap is, is not a deterministic algorithm. It depends on, a, it depends on essentially on uh, simulations. In the sense that, let's say, you are rewiring the graph and uh, get, get better arrangements. Um, the more, let's say, the more tries you can do, the, the more robust is going to be the, the, uh, the measure. Because the closer you are, going, you are getting to the optima. So what, uh, what this means that, let's say, depending on the number of iterations that you do for calculating the optimality gap, uh, if the metric is very sensitive in the sense that it's slow to converge, it means that you need to have an, a large number of iterations in order to get the right, uh, the right optimality gap. If the convergence is fast, then with a low number of iterations, you could get the right result. Uh, this really depends on the rate of convergence. Um, I mean, the rate of convergence just depends on several things, like, for example, uh, how much variations you could have for the same, for the same subgraph, and I mean, it essentially depends on the, uh, into the amount of combinations that you could have for the same subgraph. But anyway, for, for the AVT sequence of 200 contributions, and by doing uh, 50 uh, attempts of op optimization attempts, we have that histogram. So it sort of look, looks like a B-modal one, in the sense that, I mean, you have a mode here and another mode here. One that, let's say, this one would be with low optimal gap, which means that it's very highly optimized. And this would be a bit less optimized. So those grants here could have, for example, 20% more match if they are optimized. And those grants here near 0 0.4, 0 0.5 could, ha could almost have the double the match if they are optimized. But as I said, that optimality gap, uh, we are not sure exactly if, the, if we are getting the right optimality gaps because it's an optimization problem. So it depends on the number of iterations. So what happens if we increase the number of steps? So instead of having 50 steps, we could have, for example, 200 steps. And this is what we get, where we get. And it's a different distribution, and essentially this tells that this tells us that let's say the previous plot uh, actually is wrong because I mean there was still a lot of uh, space for for optimizations on, on the subgraphs. So one thing that I did, uh, this is a new block actually, is to investigate how sensitive is the optimality gap towards the number of optimization steps. So I created here a list of. Uh, possible number of iterations, so I put here 10, 100, and 1,000 uh, number of optimization steps. And the idea is to calculate the optimality gap distribution for each, for each one of those. And the first thing to notice before uh, seeing the, the plot uh, is the amount that it takes to calculate that. So for example, to calculate uh, 10 optimization steps on my computer, it used uh, five seconds. For calculating 100, it was 30 seconds. For 1,000, it was four, uh, four minutes. And note that, let's say, this is only using uh, 200, uh, 200 collaborations. 
But when you get to, to the actual Gitcoin data, you are actually handling uh, 60,000 uh, collaborations. So, I mean, you can see, you can quickly see where it is gets, especially considering that, where, that the quadratic funding algorithm is quadratic in complexity. In the sense that, let's say, if you double the number of contributions, uh, the time it, that it takes to calculate the quadratic funding doesn't double. It actually gets uh, four times as bigger. So, yeah, uh, we can quickly have a problem there. Anyway, I told, this is the distribution of the optionality op gap uh, when you have different optimization iterations. So, for example, for 10 optimization iterations, uh, you can see that, let's say, most of the grants are near zero. So, I mean, if you iterate, uh, you, if you don't iterate much, every grant, almost every grant will seem like if it, if it was optimal already. Um, I think this is sort of intuitive, actually. <laughs> if you do 100 iterations, then you get something near 0 0.3 or 0 0.4. And if you do 1,000 optimization iterations, then you are, you are starting to get close to 0 0.7, 0 0.6. And I mean, what this means that, let's say, in order to get the, the true optimality gap of the grants, you are, we need to do lots of iterations. I mean, in the order of thousands of iterations, maybe 1,000, maybe 5,000, 10,000, I don't know. In order to actually know how much iterations we need to have, we would need to calculate the rate of convergence. Essentially, we want to know how much the metric changes when you have different numbers of, uh, of uh, iteration, optimization iterations. And the idea is that, let's say, most probably there is a number that, tell, that you don't have additional convergence or then the additional, additional convergence is very slow. So this could be 1,000, 10,000. Actually, in a certain way, this sort of resembles a lot, let's say, the cross-validation curves that you see on, on machine work, learning workflow. In the sense that, let's say, there is a point that, let's say, you don't get, get, you don't get a lot of improvements after you go past of that, go past that. So I mean, I think this is the big update since last week. Uh, we now have the ability gap, but now we have this additional problem that uh, quadratic funding is a very expensive algorithm to to evaluate. And I mean, I, I was trying to do some other things, like for example, calculate the ability gap across time, but I mean. Uh, without solving this performance issue, uh, I'm severely constrained on uh, on how I can spend the, I mean, on how I can uh, could make that, that analysis, analysis a bit more comprehensive in terms of amount of data. While I restrict myself to, let's say, to, a, to subsets of the graph, while I restrict myself to, let's say, to tiny amounts of data, then it's possible to proceed. But in order to, let's say, to make use of the full data, probably we are going to need to improve the performance of the algorithm. Um, I mean, I, I already have some ideas. This is going to be, this is going to be topic of future working sessions. But uh, I only wanted to give you an update about that. Uh, anyway, uh, any questions about that? Uh, any comments? Uh, Danilo, you, you, can you just explain a little bit of the intuition? I think you said uh, with like a single iteration, the optimality gap will be one. Um, uh, did I get that right or wrong? Um, and some of the, the intuition behind that. So uh, let's go back to the optimality gap definition. When the optimality gap is zero, it means that the grant is, is, is optimally arranged. In the sense that, let's say, the closer the grant is to zero, the more optimal is the collaborations arrangements around this community towards, let's say, maximizing quadratic match. Mm -hmm. If it's close to one, it means that it's very far away from optimizing the match. So what happens is that, let's say, when you will do those optimization iterations, essentially you are rewiring the graph. You, you are, let's say, you are taking handle collaborations and switching the nodes. Let's say you are changing the structure of the community around the grant so that you can, let's say, guess, so that you can discover, let's say, what is the optimal approach. So the more iterations you apply, the more you are, let's say, getting closer to that optimal op 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 point. Mm -hmm. 
So if you don't iterate much, uh, you are going to be very close to the original graph. Because, for example, 10 observed iterations means that I have uh, tried uh, 10 times to rearrange the graph. 1,000 means that I, ha I have tried 1,000 times. So the more I try, the closer I can get to the, op the, to the optimal point. Um, uh, and I mean, the, the, the more that we, I know the optimal point, the more I can, let's say, get that distance between the optimal point and the hill point. Uh, did it was clear or, or not? Yeah, so that makes sense. The way you explained it makes sense. But when I see the axes here, the y axes, it seems like it's the opposite. Uh, like Exactly. Like we would have the highest optimality gap on zero iterations. Uh, but I see here it's the opposite because the lighter colors are the higher count. Yeah, so I mean, when the optimality gap is higher, it means that the distance between the hill subgraph and the optimal subgraph is higher. When it's close to z the optimal gap is close to zero, it means that let's say the hill graph is very close to the optimal graph. Uh, but note that the optimal graph, uh, we don't know the, the exact optimal graph. We, we are estimating the optimal subgraph. Mm -hmm. so, so for example, if the optimization iterations is zero, the optimal subgraph mm -hmm. is going to be equal to the hill subgraph. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the optimal gap is going to be zero. I'd also further note that there's a little bit of a trickiness happening here because one of the ways that you look at iterative optimization algorithms where you don't know the real optimal is by looking at this sort of optimality gap like measures, things that like look at the improvement in the optimization objective falling off or there's a variety variety of metrics but because the thing we're exploring is an optimality gap there can be some like like conceptual collisions between what we're measuring sort of because we're optimizing in the first place mm -hmm. just to find an optimality gap versus how you judge the progress of an optimization algorithm which often compares um <clears throat> things like the in the change in the score of the optimal. So behind the scenes, what's happening here is that the how optimal the thing we think of as optimal is. So I don't know if we might need another figure or at some point to sort of express this idea that when we solve an instance of the, um, the rewiring optimizer, what's happening is that the objective, which is the max allocation extracted, is going up. So each time we go forward in more iterations, we're searching for a better and better rewiring. So as the best rewiring gets better, the optimality gap is going to, you know, we're going to expect the optimality gap to get larger, meaning people are going to seem to be less optimal because the thing that we've discovered as the best thing they could have done is better. So like yeah. there's a lot going on behind the scenes here. Yeah, maybe one way of putting, uh, because, uh, yeah, I think there is this uh, conceptual confusion in the sense that, let's say, one thing is the, is the optimality gap according to the mathematician, in the sense that, let's say, you define the optimality gap as being the difference between the optimal and the hill. Another thing is the optimality gap according to the experimental people, in the sense that, let's say, we are trying to discover what is the op optimal approach, and I mean, this optimality gap that we have on this axis is not, let's say, the final optimality gap. It is actually, let's say, the optimality gap that we are discovering. It is, the, let's say, the, the experimental optimality gap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I also have a suggestion, and since I'm going before, I'm going to have to go in half an hour. But a thought for a way to um, expedite this would be, although we are not sure or we're, we're pretty, we're, we haven't done as much investigation into an analytic solution to the optimal than uh, we might like, we have a sort of heuristic idea that the optimal rewiring has this sort of uniform property to it. So where you basically split up your mo money evenly. So one thing we could do to attempt to accelerate this is rather than start the random rewiring with the initial condition of the essentially the initial wiring we could actually start these iterations by saying that the what we think is the optimal rewiring is this 
heuristic where we take you know all the money that we the potential colluders had and say there's n of those potential colluders that we spread it out evenly and we do this sort of naive attack as the starting point and then run our iterative algorithm from there and that's a sort of bootstrapping of the optimization algorithm which we're not saying that's the optimal strategy but what happens when you're doing these kind of optimizations is that you're really like exploring and descending and if you start closer to um you know something good then you don't have to get there um and again we don't know for sure that that's the optimal but it's sort of instinctually because of the way qf works we might expect that some um sort of approximately uniform distribution of resources actually is already closer to the optimal so one thing we could do is try hot starting with something like that and then seeing how much that affects something like the plot Danilo is showing us right now. Yeah. A brief question on the initial wiring. The initial wiring is at the moment the based on the data of the funding round. Yeah, the, right now the initial wiring, wiring is simply is simply the, the real wiring of the data. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the starting point. Um, that, 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 as he has just said, I think it's a lot rela uh, related to some of the things that uh, I was thinking on exploring for today's session here. So, as I've said, uh, th uh, we have, for example, here some examples of attack vectors that uh, we could use. And, I mean, one approach to, to using those attack vectors are for just in doing a, a B test, but this would require calculating the optimality gap anyway. Another way of using was to, let's say, if we can have a general way of, let's say, you have uh, those lists of nodes and you have a given uh, number of contributions, we could try to use the initial reward in a way that conforms to the attack vectors. So that would be, let's say, a risk for having a better st starting point. Because to be fair, uh, when you calculate the opportunity gap, you don't need to start from, to start from scratch. Because if you got, if you get a, let's say, a starting point that is good, is very good, or I mean, if you if you have a starting point that is already optimal, what is going to happen is that if you increase the number of iterations, the upper the gap is not going to increase, or is going to increase very little, because you are already at this optimal state. So bootstrapping could be an excellent tactic for reducing the number, the, I mean, for for increasing the rate of convergence. And if Instead anybody's it, if anybody's yeah. interested in this kind of thing, the 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 given what's here, one way to do this, which is sort of like an ensemble bootstrap, would be to take each one of the attacks in a list as the starting point, and then to run each of them for a much smaller, like to, to then iterate near each of them for a much smaller period of time, and then just take the best of the best. It's more of an ensembling approach though, where you would just say, cool, there's three seed neighborhoods, which are come from attacks. You start the, the optimization algorithm, the rewiring optimization that's, um, that Danilo put together from each of the three attack seeds, then let each of them run for a comparatively small period of time, then look at each one of their scores and just take the best one from each of those threats. And in my mind, that's the kind of sort of like structural hack that can get you around these like really long run times. It might still not give you the the true optimal, but it, it would be um, a way of leveraging the a priori knowledge effectively. Because you're saying we expect the optimal solution to be near one of these things. We don't necessarily know which. And then given that we sort of search around in this vicinity, you kind of figure out which one is, is um, like scores the best and essentially take the max of some maxes which you still know like, from an opt there's a nice compositional property in you know max in, in, in maximizing here where like if 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 you uh, if you if you try three or four or five threads then like you can let them go for a shorter period of time figure out which one scores the best overall and just grab that um, and again I'm I'm not necessarily suggesting that we we have to go to that level of complexity right this moment but what we're doing is we're trading off um the sort of we'll say the numeric the the 
the data driven or computation driven sort of open ended problem, which is searching a much larger space um, for something where we give this algorithm more information in advance, and therefore, you know, we we are putting more knowledge into it. If we say here are three or four or five attack vectors we want to use as seeds and then just search in their vicinities, um, if the optimal solution is not in one of those vicinities, we're not going to find it. But there's a good chance that we'll find something much closer to the optimal solution in fewer time steps by taking this sort of quick, like, oh, let me grab a couple points that are far away from each other, but all potentially close to an optimal, search in their little neighborhoods, see which one was the best, and run with that. So, like, these are, again, they're kind of hacks, but they're ways of attacking this computational complexity problem that are, um, they're, like, operationally prudent, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, last comment before I jump into the, to the attack vectors. Uh, Another thing that would, uh, let's say, make it also a lot easier to do those optimization iterations is that, as I said, the quadratic funding algorithm is quadratic in complexity. But uh, we, we don't have our suspicions that this is not necessarily the, the case if you optimize the algorithm so that it has, for example, an iterative approach or maybe a linear algebra formalism. So I know that some of the guys here, uh, let's say, are inside the Gitcoin research group. So I mean, uh, an interesting research topic that could also exist would be to express the quadratic funding algorithm in a linear algebra formalism and in an iterative way instead of, a, let's say, of a computational formalism. So, for example, on the Gitcoin grand salary match HackMD, that is on the notion, and I mean, probably you guys have seen this document sometimes. Uh, on the end of that document, I started to lay out some some ways that how you could express, for example, the pairwise total term of the quadratic funding algorithm in a linear algebra notation. And if you have if you have a linear algebra notation, you could also take the difference of let's say what happens to that matrix when you add or remove a contribution. That will be if the complexity factor of that term is linear, for example, or, or even constant, uh, doing those evaluations would be a lot quicker. Because, I mean, you are dropping a complexity factor. And not only that, but if you have a linear algebra formalism, you could use uh, several high performance libraries. Because, uh, I mean, doing linear algebra is way quicker than doing uh, graph analysis. So, a quick and point I on could... this. Oh, if yeah. So, it was just that for people who are maybe not familiar with the algebraic graph theory, the graphs that we're dealing with in particular, and I think Danilo is going to go over this anyway, can be represented, the, the rewiring problems can be represented as, uh, as vector spaces, because what you actually have is a decision vector in the dimensionality of the contributor, the users or contributors cross the grants. And because they have zero, they have they take values between zero and essentially the total amount of funds being allocated. You do end up with um, a sort of vector space representation of the decision variable in the graph rewiring problem. So it's it's not um, it's not necessarily the case that we have to use algorithms that are graph based. Once you transform the problem to uh, to something that has a a, essentially a, a matrix or a vector space as the decision variable, um, this idea that the algorithm could be worked with more efficiently using a linear algebraic expression actually becomes very realistic. So we've already sort of validated that first sort of like, oh, actually it turns out that if I think of this as the, you know, the, the say there are n users and m grants in our subgraph, if we think of the n times m dimensional mm -hmm. vector space, which can either be the n by m matrix or a stacked vector, um, that thing, we only only restriction on it is that the values are positive and that they sum to the total amount of, of input donations. And searching over that space is actually searching over a convex polytope, which means that you know in moving the representation of this away from its combinatorial graph theory representation into an algebraic one, we could actually significantly improve um, both our understanding of the algorithm and also the performance of its implementation. Yeah, and I mean, to be clear, 
Uh, this is an open problem. We don't have that linear algebra formalism yet. And I mean, this could be a super high value for Gitcoin, for the research. And yeah, I mean, there is this doc that could serve as a starting point. Of, I mean, I've right. already tried to put, for example, how could be the pairwise representation, but uh, I'm not. Uh, the... There is also some people. Yeah. Yeah, so I was going to say, so, so the separation here mm -hmm. is what we have is the representation of the graph object in, a, in an algebraic form, but not the computation over it. So in order to compute the quadratic match, including the, you know, there's this sort of second module that was added, this pairwise um, uh, term. But the, that algorithm itself, we haven't converted it into a vector space representation, but the decision, the, 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 the decision variable of the optimization problem is that matrix that I just described, that n by m matrix, or that n times n stacked vector. And so we know that there's a the thing that you compute from is a is representable as a vector space. And so the question becomes when you apply the algorithms that were specified, whether or not they um, they sort of can also be viewed as as linear algebraic as opposed to combinatorial. Yeah, this is very interesting. I, I I have a quick question. By the way, I'm fairly new to this. This is my first official meeting. Uh, and when when you're discussing the vector representation, that just you know, there's a parallel to how you explore uh, some of these models, like in artificial intelligence and deep learning. And I'm just curious if, when you're representing um, all this information in vectors, is there a temporal aspect to them too that you guys explore in terms of quadratic funding or the matching part? Uh, so for what we're doing now, I'm going to say no, because the algorithm for matching was specified a priori by the sort of researchers who wrote the paper on QF and by and was implemented by um, the Gitcoin team um, in that form. I would say, though, more generally, our models tend to represent these as time varying graphs, and we take snapshots and apply that logic. So once you create the um, uh, sort of vector space representation, or if you're talking about the graphs, it's also fine. Um, you can think about this as sequences of these graph objects in time, and that's how our CAD-CAD model works. So the answer is sort of yes and no. Gitcoin doesn't really treat them as time varying. We've sort of imposed the time varying view on it when we built our CAD-CAD model. And I think to your point, there's a lot of interesting information to be uncovered by examining the temporal component. Gotcha, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for for your insight. Yeah, especially considering that, let's say, if we have a linear algebraic model for that, uh, adding time is really about uh, adding additional ad dimensions. So it becomes a lot easier to create a time representation. That would be, let's say, a positive side effect of building on, into that. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, any more questions? If not, I'm going to attack vectors here. So, so as I said, uh, is Jaja here, by the way? Mm, no. Uh, so, uh, one of our colleagues at Block Science, uh, Jaja, uh, she has been studying uh, quadratic funding for some weeks. And one thing that uh, she did uh, this last week was to create a notebook that, let's say, creates some representations of uh, attack vectors on Gitcoin grants. And for example, the first uh, representation that uh, she did create is a case, let's say, where you have a grant and you have uh, lots of fr friends. And all your friends donate to the same grant. So this is what would be a kind of attack that in thesis the pairwise funding mechanism should, uh, uh, should mitigate. But there is another uh, second type of attack that uh, is, uh, is an interesting one, that in, uh, theoretically it could be bypass the uh, pairwise uh, 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 total uh, term. That is that. You create, let's say, some grants and you create several fake users, the blue nodes here, and you donate in a such a way that, let's say, you minimize the overlap. So this would be a way of tricking the current implementation. And the idea that I had was to, let's say, was to simply pick those graphs that uh, she created 
uh, get a subset of the data that we had, maybe let's say take a subset of the first uh, 100 uh, contributions, and do a IB test in the following way. For example, here we have a one, two, three, uh, four, five, six, uh, yeah, six. We have 14 contributions here. No, uh, we have actually 11 contributions. And I mean, I think that we could test two scenarios. Uh, first, suppose that let's say we have 11 contributions that are related to the attack vector. The second scenario would be 11 contributions that let's say get from the Git historical data. So let's say, what happens to the network when you have organic growth? And what happens to the network when you have growth? But this growth is due to attack vector introduction. And this is one way that I thought of approaching. And then for those two scenarios, we would calculate the operability gap for maybe, I think that maybe 500 uh, iterations should, uh, should give you some insight. Of course, I, I don't know if exactly if 500 iterations is good enough because, I mean, we have that limitation that uh, the algorithm is slow, so it takes a uh, long to calculate. But anyway, uh, when we improve the algorithm, when we, we introduce bootstrapping, at least we will have something ready to, let's say, to do a more, a more comprehensive test if we have the scenarios in place. Uh, so it is clear the, the strategy that I am laying off. Uh, I mean, it's clear why, why I want to do that or what we can get from that. So, okay. So given that, uh, le let me think how we could, uh, let's say, do that on our current notebook. So what I need to do is to create a function that, let's say, take the graph that I am studying and inject a, a new graph into it. So let me see here. So for example, I think that the first thing to keep in mind is that, for example, for the, for the operating gaps that I have did some analysis here, I'm picking a static point on time. So the idea that is, let's say, we have that G here, that is the Gitcoin, is the graph that represents the Gitcoin state at, let's say, after 200 uh, contributions. And the idea is that, let's say, I want to test that graph in two, into two situations. The first one, I would pick G, and I would add, let's say, 11 new contributions from the data. So this would be analogous to, let's say, instead of having graph index 200, it could be 211. But when I add the attack vector, I need to have a different approach. I would select the graph index at 200, and I need to have some kind of function that, let's say, something that does something like that, uh, inject uh, attack vector G. So I think that uh, maybe the first step that we could do is to maybe create a more clean state of that. So we have this notebook, but I think that I'll create a new notebook. So I'll copy that one here. I'll paste a new one. Um, let's give it a nice name. So attack vector EB test. So this is the same notebook that we've been using for the last week, but uh, just with a new name so that it relates for, the, for that AB test. And let's prepare that. So first thing uh, is to change the, the title. So let's say this notebook is, uh, would be AB test for attack vectors. I mean, operability gap. And one thing that we could do is to drop the, the cells after that because we don't need them. So let's simply throw them off. 
and let's run it so that we have, uh, let's say, a clean state to... I'll drop that to 100 so it runs a bit faster. So let's go. Also, let me change that section here. So Okay. So I think that the, the most natural thing that we could have now, uh, now would be if we create a function that injects a new graph into an existing graph. So I know that, that for instance, uh, Network X has some functions, like for example, add nodes from, add edges from. So perhaps we could try to start with something along that. So one way of uh, testing that, let me think here. Hmm. I mean, I think that we could simply use that as the first case. So let's say GA would be that. And distribution for A would be that. So that would be, let's say, the, the organic case. And, and as we are going to inject that graph here, and that graph has, for example, uh, 11 cases, we would put a 100 plus 11. But then we would have a, a block here for, let's say, for, for the attack vector case. So how we would express? We would do that, but we would throw that, that 11 out. And then we have the, the graph here. So let me call that GB. And then we would have the distribution here for GB. And actually, actually this is GA. And the idea is that, let's say, we need to introduce the attack, attack, attack vector in that block in some way. So let me see how I can use that, uh, that, that code here to inject into that. So let us see. Grants, users, be partied. So let's try that. Maybe we could do that and then that. And then we generate a graph here. The only thing is that, let's say, there is a problem with that graph that uh, when you calculate the quadratic fund, you need also to know the amount in dollars that uh, each collaboration has. So probably we are going to need to add something to that. So let me clean that a bit. So let's say a graph that represents a attack vector. That would be an independent graph. So and when you look at the G, uh, G2, if you look at, uh, oops. If you look at the edges, like for example, by passing that they go out through, there is no property inside them. And if you pass, for example, GB, which is the one that came from Gitcoin data, from the Gitcoin data, mm, oops. you can see that, let's say, there is a lot of info, like for example, the amount. Not only that, but the nodes also have types. So we need to prepare that graph here that is on this notebook so that it represents uh, nodes and edges just like in Gitcoin data. So the first thing, I, I would start with adding amounts to the edges. And we need to add that amount attribute here. 
and well, I think that this edge edge is from. I think that you can pass a argument that uh, tells what is going to be a T attributes. And actually, I'm not not sure. So let me Google that. Edges from. Uh, by the way, uh, just for just for your information. Uh, there is a pull request based on the work that we did on last last week on Network X. It's here. Uh, where it is? So the result of our working session last week it has turned it into a pull request on network on the networks library here. Edge rewiring optimizers for simulating an alien hill climbing. But anyway, this is just a trivia thing. So let us see how we can add that attribute. So we have that argument here, Atria. It's keyword arguments. And edge data can be assigned to use it keyword arguments. Let's see how it works. So I think it sets, let's say, if you provide a key and value, it's going to put the same value for everybody. So I think that the first approximation that we could do is simply suppose that, let's say, that the attack vector is going to provide just $1 uh, for everyone. So let's do that. Amount equals 1. Uh, is it clear why I'm doing that? Why I'm just passing amount equals 1 on the edge from? So let us see here. Yeah, now we have the amounts inside the collaboration. So uh, this was the first step. And let's see now how how to add the, the type. Because, I mean, if you look, for example, at gb.nodes, equal, data equals true, uh, for each node, you also have the information of, uh, of the type, if it's a true contributor, or a, or a grant, and the total amount that it has received. I thought, the, I, thought I think that this total amount is, is not used. So the second step here would be to pass, let me see here, uh, edges, edge nodes from network X. So yeah, it's the, it's the same thing from when compared to edge edges from. So here we are adding the grant. So we would pass, for example, type equals grant. And here we would pass type equals contributor. And let us see how it behaves now. Yeah, now we have the types here. So as now we have the attributes that we need to, let's say, to say that this G2 is, is sort of like a, is sort of like from Gitcoin data, in the sense that we need those, those attributes in order to, to perform our calculations. Now the thing is, how we add those things here inside the, the other graph? Let us see if there is a function for that. Network X uh, concatenate graph. I don't know if you... mm, it's like overflow. Usually I like when there is a one-liner one for that. Like for example, if there is a function that tells oh, join graph, uh, I don't like those solutions that involve lots of lines because I mean it's always hard to understand and maintain afterwards. So the first thing that I try to search when I don't know something is, uh, is always if there is a one-liner for that. This sounds promising, you knew. Yeah, let's see how, how that works. NX, uh, dot union, uh, GB, G2. Hmm. Let's try to draw it. Hmm. I'll do a quick hack here just to see what happens if I, I remove G2. Actually, let's compare. 
So this is the union of the two graphs, and this is we ought the we ought the attack vector. So we have this giant, giant component here, and we have some isolated uh, guys here. Actually, it's a bit hard to see. Yeah, it's a bit hard. Let me try as not the size equals one. Yeah, it's better now. Yeah, so the attack vector is here. Uh, for example, this is the graph without the attack vector. You can see that there is a giant component here. There is a guy here that, let's say, is a, is a grant and several people connected to the same grant. And also some isolated clusters here. When you look at the graph when we, we pass the NX.Union, we have the, this cluster here that has three grants and has several people connected to each one. So yeah, I think this sort of, I mean, this isn't exactly a validation, but let's say for prototyping purposes, it seems that it seems that it's working. So I think that we can go forward with that. Um, everything good so far. Also, we could uh, try to see the, the previous one, just to see how that one looks. So let, let us see, let's G A. Yeah, it's very similar to the one we ought to attack vector. So given that, I think that we can, we can simply uncomment here that line of the distribution and let's see if we can run without any, without any issue. Mm. I love when things run without issues. Mm -hmm. Let us see how is the look of that distribution B. By the way, I have modified the, the definition of the OpenLite gap per grant function so that now we, instead of having a list, we have a dictionary that informs the OpenLite gap for each grant. So the on our attack vector, uh, the grants are, the, let's say, the, the colluding grants would be the grant zero, the, the grant uh, one, and the grant two. So let, let us see if we can find thing here. So maybe distribution B zero. Ah, so I forgot to to pass that. So GB is going to be the union of the GB and GG. Okay, I think this should work. Let us see. Yeah, so this is the opportunity gap of the of the attack of one of the attack vectors. So it's zero dot five twenty five. Actually, we could, let's print out of them. So, so I'm going to print a, the opality gap of the three grants of the, that belongs to the attack vector. Also, I'm going to print here the median of the opality gaps that, of the grants that are not attack vectors. So actually I'm going to print the median of everyone. So, I, it would we would pass uh, np dot medium, and here I would put a v for v in distribution. V. Yeah, I think this should work. No, this needs to be a list copying. Okay, there is a lot of names in there, so. I need to filter thing. If V is P is none, V not. Okay. So this, 
the, this first value here is the medium of the operating gap across all grants. And the below values here are the optimality gap for each of these three grants here. And as I can see, they are very similar. So we need to keep in mind that we didn't do a lot of, uh, of uh, optimization steps. So probably this is biasing the, our information here. But anyway, uh, we at least we have a code for trying that. So what we could do now is to maybe increase that number of iterations. So let's try, for example, 500. And let's see how much time it takes. Mm. Yeah, not very fast, but. Anyway, uh, everything good so far. Can you maybe, in a nutshell, um, I'm a little bit struggling why the numbers of the uh, the results of the optimality gap are similar, but in any ways different. And um, it looks like, for example, zero and one should be similar because of the uh, wiring. Can you ex again repeat how they are so? Um, Hmm. How this is, where the results are coming from and why this is different, uh, why zero, one, two are so different in terms of the optimality gap. So the first thing, yeah, and I think this is a very interesting result. Uh, notice that, let's say, the second value, I mm -hmm. mean, the second grant, the second colluding grant has a mm -hmm. higher optimality gap than the others. And so what one, is... Number yeah, one. number one here. Mm -hmm. And what this means? Uh, this means that the grant one uh, can be better optimized than when compared to grant two and grant zero. Mm. And this is interesting because if you get, if you see the grant one, it has more overlapping contributors than the, other, than the others. Let's say grant two only has the contributor nine that is, let's say, I mean, Contributor 11 and 10, they are just donated to two, the nine is donated to one. But grant one has two overlapping contributors. So I keep to, uh, I think to keep in mind is that grant two and zero is similar, but grant one is different. The same that grant one has more overlapping contributors. And I mean, it's, it's that interesting thing to think about. And, if you look at that on our first try, you can see that uh, grant two and grant zero, that is, let's say, the first value here and the last value here, has a very similar optimality gap. But grant one has a much higher optimality gap. And yeah, it's kind of curious to think about that. Uh, notice also, that, let's say, the, the medium of the optimality gap is, is between those two. I mean, it's a bit uh, it's a bit fuzzy science in the sense that uh, I mean uh, we are do just doing exploratory things, but it leaves me sort of wondering: uh, yeah. is there organic case between grant two and grant one in terms of distribution of co collaborations? But I mean, this is just a thought that I had, just a piece of intuition. Anyway, uh, let's try to increase seven more that number of iterations. So that took one minute. Let's try to put uh, maybe two two thousand. This is going probably going to take uh, four minutes. So let's run it. And while it is home, I think that I'm going to try the, the other attack vector that we do have here, which is essentially this one. So the idea of that was let's say attack vector is essentially lots of contributors. So just one grant, and we can see how it behaves. So let me put it here. By the way, I think that I should print also here. In the above one here is how how the organic keys behaves.
we can run that because uh, I mean we already have a job belong here belong here. And while it is running, I'm going to implement that. So we would have uh, let me clone that. I'm going to get uh, this first block here. And I am going to paste here below. And let's put here uh, many users to a single grant. And also, I think that we could uh, explain that a bit, the vector vector. So this is one kind of attacker to many users to make grants. And this is the attacker case too, where you have many users to a single grant. And well, let's explain that. So let me see how it works. So okay, just copy that. So the same thing, we're adding nodes and adding edges. And the thing is that where we add, add nodes, we have must put that that argument here. So let's put the okay. Oops, actually this is great, but I will change in a bit. And a fun thing is that let's say there are so many that we could try to do with that. So for example, a simple variation that we could try. Uh, Notice here that all the amount is, is, is just $1. But what happens, for example, if we try 10 cents or we try $100? Uh, how the ability gap changes depending on the amount of that are putting? What if the amount, instead of they being all the same, they are actually randomized? They are, let's say, follow a random distribution or maybe a uh, Python distribution. I mean, there is an infinite number of distributions. But it's not, let's say, well, that code, there are several type of holes that we could uh, also use, use to the deep deeper. I mean, this is the number of iterations of course, they are, uh, but I mean, there is so many variations that we could do for exploring that. Uh, uh, if you guys are seeking for ideas for the research group, uh, uh, I can show you that I'm not mining there. So uh, let's go back to the one that I also do at some months. And not that this is like that, but for a while, I will not do that now. So actually, I can also change the name here. So this is C. Uh, let's create attack vector here. Give me uh, the same amount of grants. Uh, not grants, but the same amount of contributions across our, our cases. And I think this is sort of it. We no, now need to do the union here. So nx uh, gc equals nx dot union. And then gc and attack eg. And then we would calculate the distribution. So the distribution of c is that. And we would print the results here. But I would print only the distribution of zero. So in order to start, I'm only going to calculate 50 iterations just to, I mean, just to see if we don't get an error. Uh, yeah, we got an error, that's why. So what's the problem with that? Dot difference. Hmm. Yeah, what's happening here? So let me parse that again. So grants, this is a set, okay. Dot, uh, I'm... Yeah, here we are iterating on the users. Dot, um... uh, 
Okay, so actually the users are being added here, so the grant should not be here. I think that I will adopt a different approach. So, this is going to be the grants. And this is going to be the, the users. And instead of being that, uh, the users are going to be the range between 0 and 11. Let, let us see. Let, yeah, I think it worked. So here I'm creating an iterator that goes, actually, I think this should be 12. Uh, let me check that. Yeah, it should be 12. So uh, number, actually I'll create a, a variable here. So attack vector contributions is going to be 11. And the range here is going to be attack vector contributions plus one. I think this is more explicit. Being explicit is always good. Uh, is it clear uh, why I did that? Hmm. What happened here? Hmm, there is something weird in there. Oops, at least distribution C. Mm, that's interesting. The, the ability gap for that first attack vector is much higher than the mean of the organic case. Of course, the number of iterations is low, but before uh, increasing the number of iterations, let's uh, do that the organic case again. And this is distribution A. Actually, let me leave that more. Uh, let's say case A. Optimality gap is equal to that. Mm. Optimality gap gap medium. Um, Let me put a space in here. And also, yeah, I think this, should, this is clear. And let me print that. I will use F3 here so that it becomes a bit cleaner. Also print another thing here just to just to make it a bit cleaner. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, I think this should work. Another thing that I'm going to put here is a floating uh, uh, precision specifier. I'll put here then so just that it runs faster. I think this goes in here. No. Go, how I get rid of that? Yeah, I think now is good. I'll put four. So I'm going to increase now the number of iterations. I mean, just last a last test for the print, and then I'm going to change the others. So okay. 
by the way, this is an interesting thing. Yeah, because let's say now that we can we have a, a pre, we can have the median here in a pretty way, we can see, for example, how the opportunity gap changes on the organic case, for example, if you have just one iteration. And the result is zero. I mean, the ability, if you do just one optimization step, the opportunity gap of the of the graph is going to be zero, so the real sub graph is already optimal because we didn't take the time for actually optimizing the problem. So that's why it's important to do a lot lots of iterations. So for, suppose, for example, that we put five iterations and then this is increases to 1%. And actually, given, I, I think that we could put a percentage here. Hmm. Yeah, I think that from now on, I'm going to use the, uh, percentages for the expressing the optimality gap. By the way, what, what do you guys think? Uh, do you guys think that percentage makes it a bit clearer or not? Or it's be best to return to the floating point? I feel floating point is better. Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> so, okay, back to the floating point. So now that we have that, uh, we can uh, do that now for the other cases here. So here is this one is for B. So this one would, would operate on B. And we have all those prints that we need to put in here for the. So let's put here for the this oops distribution B zero and then the format specifier. And let's do that for one and two two also. Another thing is that I think that we, we could also plot the histogram. So let me do a quick iteration here. Oops, what happened? And I think that I would do a histogram too. So histogram uh, distribution B. Or maybe I'll dig up if Alice. Yeah. So I think this should give us a good summary of what's happening. And let me increase that. Yeah, I will use that. So let's do that for the case A2. And let's do that for the case B. And actually, this is case B. Case B. And let's do for case C now. And, and with that, we are we are going to have the sort of an um, EB test for those different cases. So case C, C, C. And actually, this is C. Hmm. Oh, I forgot to calculate the medium here. Case is C. Probably. This could be wrapped in a function, it would be even more practical. Ah. That's why it's useful to start with a long number of iterations. Mm. What's happening? Ah, 
I forgot to, it's actually a grant here. It was a typo here. It was grants instead of grant. But yeah, now it went. So I think that we are in conditions of uh, increasing the number of iterations and actually seeing how things compare. So let's go with attack, ve attack vector case two first. So let's put here. So this is an interesting one because it's saying, sta saying that, let's say the attack vector is fully optimized even though the number of iterations is 50. That's a pretty good attack vector. Ah, but I think there is a problem. Yeah, there is a problem. Uh, the problem is that, let's say, that attack vector here, uh, it's isolated from the network. So what this means is that, let's say, there is no way of rearranging that. Uh, can you see why? Uh, because we, yeah, uh, because uh, let us see the other attack vector, for instance. Uh, when we try to optimize that graph, uh, we are getting the connections here between the contributors and the grants, we, and we are trying to rewire in the sense that, let's say, instead of uh, user 11 contributing to grant 2, he would contribute to grant 1, for example. And what happens is that uh, what happens is that let's say on that graph here above, there is no way of uh, rewiring because I mean you only have one grant. There is there is there is not another grant so that you can rewire. So I mean this graph is already optimal because because they, there are no neighbors. I mean if it, there is a use. If one of the, those users here did contribute to another grant, then it would be possible to rewire. But given our definition of the number of subgraph, we can't rewire that graph. So I don't know if it is, this possibly could be a limitation of our method or, I, I, I don't know, actually this is subjective, but I mean, it's, is it clear why that graph must always be optimal? So it makes total sense that if there is only one grant, we can't rewire. But I just wonder if there would be a similar, so how we could translate this kind of um, attack to a working attack in a way. Yeah, and actually, I mean, this, is a, this attack vector is very interesting in the sense that, I, I mean, Suppose that we have a Gitcoin grant that we do detect that, let's say, all the contributors are donating only to the same grant. I, I mean, there is no, there is no overlap. Uh, I think this would be an obvious case for flagging because it's a bit weird, isn't it? I mean, a grant that you don't, you don't have any overlapping contributor. Yeah. I mean, in a, cert in a certain sense, even though this is a, uh, is a strange case, the sense that is always up, no? in a certain sense, it also makes sense to, I mean, if the application of the optimality gap is to flag potential grants for, let's say, for having a, a, for having a human to look into, I think it, it sort of makes sense to flag that. Yeah. Uh, what do you first think? Filter, first filter to apply. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, so in a certain sense, even though it's strange because you can't optimize that graph, given that the use case of the optimality um, gap would be for flagging grants, and uh, I mean, it sort of, of passes in that first test, test. But I mean, for research purposes, it's it's a bit bad because uh, yeah, there is no you can't do a lot with that. Uh, I mean, we could do a lot with that subgraph. Maybe more, more interesting would be, for example, if we create a, another attack vector where you have overlap between the contributors. But I mean, this would be this would require uh, creating a new a third attack vector. So it would be, let's say, the, 
É, this attack vector, but in a way that let's say connects to the remain of the network. Anyway, uh, let, let us see the, this one here. Because uh, I think this this is maybe the most this I think this is the most interesting one. Let's put now uh, 100, 100 iterations just to make sure that things are working. Okay, so we have let we have that the green one is still being a high, have a higher optimality gap. We have the medium, and now we have the distributions. Now let's try. Let's increase the scale of it for maybe 2,000. And I also, I think that we could also put the 2,000 on the other one here, on the, on the organic case. And now it's really weight. And probably it's going to take a while. I mean, that's why the, having having to implement the quadratic funding algorithm in a linear algebra formalism would add so much value because we are taking three, five minutes now and we are using a tiny subset of data. But if the algorithm was faster, we could prototype that much faster. We, we could do much more, thousand, uh, much more thousands of iterations uh, we could use more data. I mean, we could do a much more comprehensive uh, experimentation with that. So, in a certain sense, uh, uh, doing research requires some infrastructure. And when you talk about infrastructure, I mean, there is the, there is the computational infrastructure of mean you have fast computers, you have, uh, you have memory, you have the softwares. But uh, another kind of infrastructure is to, al is to also have things specified in a way that let's say you don't have a, a performance hits in a way that you can implement in a straightforward way. So all kinds of specification also are, let's say, research infra infrastructure. And one of the reasons of why it's so slow to calculate that is that right now we have a static algorithm in the sense that let's say uh, we must compute the quadratic funding for every one every time that we hear the graph but if we could compute only how much the scores changed given for example just one rewiring i have the strong suspicion that instead of having a quadratic complex algorithm we could have a linear one so just to be clear what happens. Uh, right now, every time that we hear a graph, we essentially have to compute this entire graph here described by P. Um, not, uh, not that this is already very optimizing the sense that, that I did create a, a formalism for that because the actual way that we compute the matrix P is by using the following. Let me go above here. The actual way is by using that. And I mean, this can be a bit, this is a bit terse because I've tried to make it compact because the actual definition is here above, is in the code. But what this tells us is the following. Uh, we have two for loops here that are iterating over all the contributions. So, uh, I mean, just that uh, generates a uh, quadratic complexity because you have a list and then you iterate on that list and every time that you iterate on that list, you iterate again on that list. And same thing for computing the So it's very expensive comp computationally. And And just wait, waiting. 
By the way, yeah, any comments about the taste play? <laughs> ok. So, this is interesting. Uh, yeah, this is interesting. Uh, just to tell why uh, I'm thinking this is interesting. Uh, so, this is the distribution of the optimality gap. And as you can see, there are two clusters in there. There is the, let's say, the main cluster in here. And I think that I showed the increased the number of beans, but okay, we can do that afterwards. Uh, but the thing is, uh, a lot of them are just zeros. And I suppose that the, we have five grants that are zeros. And I suppose that this is because they are isolated uh, clusters in the sense that, I mean, you have that same case here where you don't have overlapping contributors. If you don't have overlapping contributors, then your, op your op optimality gap is going to be zero. But when you get a, when you see those beans here, that is, let's say, pay, uh, around uh, 0 0.5, for example, that uh, there is a bin, there is an outlier here on zero zero four. I, I mean, not outlier, but but, but the tail of the main uh, cluster, the main mode, is grants that have values between three five and forty four, and we have only two grants. And now I ask yourselves, what are those two grants? If we look at that at uh, here, for example, it's about 35 to 44. If we look at the vector, that are 0 and 2, uh, they are, let's say, the tails of that mode. So this is a strong indicator that, in the, let's say, the could provide uh, some way of measuring that measuring that attack vector. So this is a, I mean, this is a interesting for the gap. It's not, but I mean, in a, it provides an insight that we, I mean, we did several optimization steps and we did 2,000. And I mean, given the convergence, this should be already converging. And the two tails of the main mode are inside the attack vectors. The, the, no, the great one apparently is on the middle of that. So let's see here. Yeah. Great one, for example, would be 58. So it would be a, a, a bit higher than me because the median is 50, uh, 51. So maybe an interesting attack will say data. I can't intermediate, donate a little amount to one, and you get a huge error to one zero. Yeah, maybe. Anyway, uh, I think I should see that with more deep. And we are finishing here the organic case. Just 30 seconds. There was this topic of match extraction, but maybe this, this was a bit too ambitious. Yeah. I, Maybe it was ambitious. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for the organic grant, uh, hmm. interesting. There are some grants that the opportunity gap is very low. And let me see the below is to grant. So five, uh, yeah, that's interesting.
Yeah, we had the overall distribution somewhat similar. But there was this cluster that is very optimized. This could be interesting to know. And let us see that. Actually, TC isn't worth looking to the histogram because uh, I think here if there is a way of seeing the, the grants individually according to the top gap. Mm, let me think about that. Maybe PX is scattered. What could be a good visualization for that? Mm. We would need a one-dimensional visualization. So one-dimensional visualization, plotly. Because I, I, I also want to know what are the, the individual grants. So I wonder if there is, I think there is a quick trick. px.scatter and distribution e. No, let me see PD data frame, distribution A, nah. maybe PD dot series. So this is going to be a this is going to be a quick hack. So s s dot name equals optionality gap, s dot index dot name equals uh, grant, and px dot scatter s is at index x is equal to Optimality gap. Same thing for the vertical axis. Let, let me see if that trick works. Now I think that I need to pass hover name. Yeah, now we can sort of see the. Let me see how I can also make it prettier. Maybe put in colors. Mm. Maybe increasing the size. What if I put a grant here? Maybe doing a bar. Almost there, so that would be. Now I would need to sort the values. Yeah, I think this maybe it's the best visualization that we could have for that. So this informs us the ability gap for the grants for the, for the organic ground case. Uh, I also put a uh, fixed width and height so that it gets a bit prettier. Yeah, I didn't improve too much. Now I will do the same thing here for distribution B. Where is distribution to and okay, I think that things are mixed up here. Yeah. Maybe I should put some colors, so I'll do the following fig def. Fig def equals that. And then fig def dot assign uh, attacker equals false. And figdef dot font query 
é, grant equals zero. Attacker equals true. Mm. No, this is not a good way. A clear better way would be the following. So here I would select some indices and attacker index would be figdf.grant using zero, one or two. Let me see if that works. Okay, now we can put a color here. Color attacker. Oops. Hmm. Still didn't work. I wonder why. Let me see here. Figdf dot query grant equals zero. Yeah, it's not setting for some reason. Maybe if I do that. Strange. Let me try three here, zero, one, two. Ah, okay, now it worked. Now I need to sort the values here by optimality gap. And I'll drop that line here. Okay, for some reason, the attackers are being into a different place. Let me see why. I think this is maybe is a is a plotly thing. Yeah, that's a plotly thing. Anyway, we can see, for example, clearly here that let's say the grant with lowest high opponent gap is 45. While if you see the grant two and zero, it's, uh, it's below that. So our attacking grants, they have the lowest opponent gap among the grants that does have opponent gap at all, except for the one. And I mean, I think this is a thing that we could, could think about. Uh, why grant one? Uh, feels like an organic grant and two and zero not. And I mean, this is a thing to think about. And another thing is, let's say, what things, how things would change if we change, for example, the amount of collaboration, what if we donate $100 instead of one? Or maybe if it is was connected to the main, main graph. I think, I mean, those are all questions that we could explore. And I'm going to push that to the, to the repo so that uh, everyone has access to that. So let me push that. Uh, commit, uh, add notebook for attack vectors AB test. And I'm going to push that now. So, I mean, 
you guys want to tinker with that, uh, try different metrics, it's going to be out there. I think he, I think it's relatively straightforward to modify and try new things now that we have the scaffold for that. And it's everything on the Gitcoin repo now. So if we go, if we go to the Gitcoin here, uh, I've just pushed it right now here. So where it is? Let me refresh that. Okay, here, attack vector A-B test. Yeah, uh, I think that's it for I mean, this working session. I would like to leave some minutes to to have to maybe to we have a free discussion. Uh, let me know your thoughts. Uh, what what are the things that you have found it more more interesting, or things that you would see to be tackled on the next session? I mean, I would like to leave the floor here. <laughs> yeah, Danilo, I want to so say, uh, yeah, really interesting. It's nice to see the comparison of the A-B test results. It, uh, For me, it clicked in a lot of the intuition uh, to see the clear discrepancy between those uh, examples uh, and how those optimality gaps are different. So it was uh, really interesting to see your workflow through through this as well. Yeah, uh, nice to hear. And I mean, uh, that was a real research session in the sense that, let's say, I didn't even open that notebook of attack vectors before. The first time that I opened was uh, one hour ago. So, I mean, that's how investigation works. And yeah, I'm kind of, I'm kind of amused actually. Uh, lots of things to think about. And I think here, let's say, what could be an interesting topic for the next working session. I guess it it would depend a bit on the, the discussions, but uh, I mean, there are several leads, for example. We could try, for example, different amounts. We could test the handle distributions for the, because we have those factors, but everyone is giving one dollar. But what if we have, if we change the strategy so that, let's say, some contributors give it lots of dollars and others not so much. In the sense that, let's say, the, the contributors that donate just one time, they could donate a lot. And the contributors that are overlapping, they could contribute just a little. Or maybe the opposite. Uh, what happens? Let's say, is the strategy, the, the strategy depends only the, on the structure or it depends also, let's say, on how, on how you allocate your resources through that structure? I mean, there is, is there a location structure be, uh, aside, beside from the contribution structure? And of course, uh, one, one thing that would be nice to tackle is also to improve the algorithm performance because it would be way cooler if we could experiment with, for example, with 1,000 uh, 1, contributions instead of 100. Or maybe use it in entire data, that would be super cool. Yeah, I find the vectorized representation to be really interesting. The uh, weighted adjacency matrix uh, structure. Uh, I've seen similar patterns in, in my past work uh, working on network models, uh, where the, the network model is great for the intuition and the initial modeling of the problem. But once you unlock that vector representation and find the appropriate uh, translation of the algorithms, uh, you get this amazing computational boost, which is such a thrilling, <laughs> exciting uh, <laughs> thing to, to unlock. So I'm I'm personally really excited on in that the vectorized representation. Oh yeah, so I was going to ask you, now is the main work to do there? Is it translating this uh, this the the optimization algorithm that we're using, which is this sort of simulated annealing? Um, search uh, through different network uh, connections between the, the contributors and the grants. Is that what is to be rep reproduced in a vectorized format, or is there more to it than that? Uh, I think that there are some directions, actually, because, uh, I mean, 
Because, for example, right now, uh, when we use, let's say, because our utility function is the quadratic funding function. So let's say one way of, uh, there are some ways of optimizing. The first one is to adopt a linear algebra formalism instead of a graph formalism. So that would involve dropping using the optimizer that we've wrote and using linear algebra optimizers. Mm. Uh, another way of improving performance is, is because, let's say, the utility function that we use is the quadratic funding for the entire graph. But if we rewrite that utility function so that we don't need to evaluate everyone again, uh, that would be so that, that probably would uh, get us a, a huge boost in the sense that uh, I mean, if you are just a Hewari graph, we don't need to compute the score for the entire graph. We just need to compute, uh, let's say, how the Hewari impact the score instead of computing everything. Mm. So if you have a, if we compute a function that let's say instead of giving us the quadratic fund, it tells us let's say, oh, you have added, added a collaboration. Uh, what I need to change on the previous scores that I gave to the grants. Let's say, what is the delta funding instead of the funding? Mm -hmm. And I think that having that delta funding would be way, way faster. Yeah, like almost perhaps, I don't know, but intuition is it could possibly be like constant time uh, or close to that, uh, or maybe linear, I'm not sure, but... I, yeah, it yeah, yeah. seems like it could be way faster than recomputing the results every time. Yeah, and actually on that spec that I've put, uh, um, I mean, there are some pointers here for both steps. There, there is uh, some pointers for doing into a linear algebra formalism. Uh, but at the same time, it's loading there. So let me go back again. So for example, there are some formalisms here that you could use for doing linear algebra operations, like for example, for the pairwise mechanism. But there is another formalism here that you could use that you could simply drop an iterator. In the, instead of having two for loops of a nested loop, you could have just a simple loop. And I mean, if you have one loop instead of two, essentially you have linear complexity instead of, instead of quadratic complexity. So this is already a, a huge thing. And I mean, it doesn't even need a linear algebra. There is a third option, but this is blocked by having the linear algebra formalism. That is, uh, maybe there is a deterministic solution for, for that op optimization problem. I mean, if you have a, yeah, it's entirely possible to have an, an analytical solution. But of course, in order to have a, that, you first need to lay out, let's say, things in a more formal way. And having a linear algebra, I think it would be the first step. So yeah, in terms of optimization, those are some directions that we could have. But of course, there are also the, the application directions too. I mean, this project is full of hybrid holes. And if you don't take care, uh, you have endless questions. <laughs> OK, so I think that's, uh, I just re I realized we're over time. So Daniil, this has been amazing. And uh, just a reminder to everyone that the TEC uh, community call is happening in the general channel. Hey guys, yeah. thank you so much. Cool session again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, happy to hear. And well, it's it's happening the TA community on the on the general voice channel. Uh, if you guys uh, don't know yet how the commons work or would like to know more about this whole ecosystem, I highly recommend you to jump in. It's an amazing community, and I mean personally for me, it's sort of a uh, crypto utopia. So, mm -hmm. I mean, lots of cool people, interesting people. Uh, and also you are seeing people that let's say, yeah, I have, it's a super cool experience. That's that's what I can say. Uh, anyway, uh, thanks guys. And well, I'll hope to see all of you again next week. And yeah. well, I'll post a agenda. And if you have suggestions, send them to, to Gitcoin and well, We'll be talking.
Bye bye. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Danilo. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Danilo.